Hey, this is William, and this is going to be me stumbling through the process of making a game for the Atari 2600. It's called Ptolemachus. Why it's called this, I'm not exactly sure yet, but he's the son of Odysseus and Penelope in the Odyssey. I've always liked that name. Not that the game has anything to do with any of that. What is the game about? Well, I'm learning that as I go about learning Atari Basic and what I can do with it. So it's sort of a synergetic, symbiotic <laughs> relationship. What I'd like to do thematically is something like Papers, Please by Lucas Pope. Now I know that's a high water mark. I'm just saying <laughs> that sort of game is an inspiration. Aim for the moon, miss and hit the stars or whatever. I just mean in terms of the strength of video game storytelling is making the player complicit and as far as an Atari game goes, <laughs> it might be uh, something of a challenge, but that's why to do it. Um, and I would just point to the audio drama for Yar's Revenge, which came out on record uh, back in the day around the time of the release of the game, which kind of recontextualizes the entire game as far as I'm concerned, which makes the whole thing sort of a agitprop satire. And I also plan on doing the full classic Atari form uh, of a complicated backstory to explain why these two pixels are bumping into each other. Uh, you know, instruction manual, comic book, box art, and uh, the whole works, the labels and everything. Uh, a friend of mine, Chris, he's offered to put the game onto an actual cartridge. So that'll be really cool. So that's what I'm working towards, and I can't wait, you know, in 2025 <laughs> or whenever I finish this, I will put in the description the various resources that I found, including forums and tutorials. So look for those links below if you also want to dive into it. Here we go. In this video, I'm going to show my first bit of programming in Batari Basic. It's, it was familiar having some previous experience with applesoft basic back in high school in fact if you're from wisconsin three years in a row i won a programming competition you may have played ronin ronin 2 the elf warrior and ronin 3 saga's end okay that was an, a certain number of years ago <laughs> okay now here's the first sprite i created in batari basic and how i animated it so, as I was telling my aforementioned friend, this is clearly a bat, but he calls it a wiggly worm. <laughs> um, so here's the code on the left, and I'll just go through it. So, REM stands for remark, and I found that out by comparing other people's code, and, and you know, it's, it's green. <laughs> so, so I knew it meant something, something different. And this is what I mean by stumbling through, because this is going to be totally nonlinear and just all over the place. I'm using Visual Studio Code, which has a free extension called Atari Dev Studio, and this includes a compiler to translate your Atari Basic into assembly, uh, which is the language the Atari will recognize. And it also includes the Stella emulator to test and play your games. I gave it a, a flat uh, custom icon to match the rest of my dock. You'll notice on the right here, a six-digit score down there, and that's like an automatic. In Batari Basic, it shows up uh, by default. And at first I thought, well, I don't want that score there necessarily. So initially I just made the score color the same as the background. But then later through uh, looking at other people's code, I discovered this little snippet here. Constant, you're setting a constant. You're setting no score to one. So one uh, as a binary number, zero would be no or false, and one would be yes or true, right? So this is, yeah, it's true, no score, and that eliminates the score from the bottom of the screen. Uh, and this little rocket that I am keep clicking is, hey, compile all this and launch the emulator. So here's the first uh, sprite that I made, the game loop, and you'll hear airplanes and whatnot outside. This is where I learned that it's very, uh, Batari Basic is very specific about spacing. So if I add a space before game loop, 
compilation failed. And the, actually the way I learned that was with the remark comment, because at first I just, it's still green. So I thought, oh, that's legit coding right there. But compilation failed. And that's where I learned that remarks require a space in front of them. And I'm just tabbing over because it, apparently it doesn't mind how many spaces. So just so this is more legible for me, I've just been tabbing commands over like this. Okay, so the no score and then the game loop. And then here I'm setting colors within the game loop. So here, and I'll go into colors in a different video, but this is 12 and this is 130. So this is the color of the background. And this is the color of player zero. And player zero is the left controller on the Atari console. It sounds, it sounds funny to say console because I don't recall calling them a console back, you know. Anyway, player one is the right joystick. And you'll see here it says that the, this is controlling the color and the luminance of player zero and missile zero. Um, and it's the same for player one and missile one in terms of they're linked together. So you can't define separate colors for the player and the player's missile, which is interesting. And that's the thing that I, that's sort of the challenge that I'm learning stumbling through the Atari coding is, you know, all these limitations of the hardware, which we are recreating in this emulated environment, which is cool, I think. Okay, and now this is setting the variable C, and this is just a counter. I have not defined this variable earlier, so the value is zero. So zero is zero plus one, so now it's one. If C equals 10, then player zero. And we have the colon, which is saying, hey, define the sprite of player zero. And you'll see we have defined here two rows of binary numbers. And what I learned was the percentage sign is, and I'm reading this off of a page called Batari Basic Commands. To express numbers as binary, place the percentage sign before a number. Make sure that you define all eight bits in the byte. But, and this is me interjecting after I've made most of this video, you can see here that I've only defined seven of the eight bits. Why the code still runs, I'm not sure. And I don't know what the disadvantage is. So I'll have to research this. So this is a, an operator that's saying, hey, the next thing you see, Mr. Compiler, is the binary definition. And if I launch the... Uh, emulator again, and I'll, I'll bring this over. You can see the top row when the wings of the bat are down <laughs> and the body is up. You can see there's three three pixels in a row there, and that's the one, one, one. So the zero, zero on the sides are pixels that are off. And then the second row, the pixels that are on, one, one, and then zero, zero, the off, and then one, one, they're on. So. Now, if this looks upside down, it's because it is. Atari sprites, for some reason, are apparently defined upside down. I don't know why that is yet. So we have that when C equals 10 and when C equals 20, and this is just a counter counting up, then it's this definition of the pixels, and that's the wings up position. Now I could, as I learned, to add a comment, a code within the line, use a semicolon. I would say wings down. And then over here I could wings up. I did read also that if you use remark, it doesn't count against your um, total of bytes. And it took me a while to find, but in, in the Atari Dev Studio, when I say it took me a while to find, I mean, it took me a while to notice. <laughs> On the bottom, um, it shows you a running count when you compile how many bytes of ROM you have left. So you'll see in this particular game, I have uh, 2,954. So that's out of 4K of ROM space, but I read that 1K is already reserved for the hardware. So you so when you make a 4K game you're actually making a 3K game. So that's going to be the fun part putting all of my ideas, well, obviously all of them won't fit into the 4K, which is actually a 3K game. Um continuing here, when C equals 20, then C goes back to 0 and we start the count again. 
And then here I'm defining the x value and the y value, the coordinates of the sprite. Player 0x is 50, player 0y is 50. Now, placing a sprite somewhere on the screen led to me discovering this bizarro tri-level way of thinking of the screen resolution uh, of the Atari 2600. At least this is how I think of it. The Atari, from what I'm learning, you have a background, you have a play field, and then you have the sprite positions. And these different fields of activity don't share a coordinate system. So first you have the background, which as far as I can tell so far, you can only just define with a color uh, and, and that's it. If it's divisible, I haven't discovered that yet. Over that, and I'm just saying that to illustrate the point here, there is no Z depth, but over that is the play field, which is 32 pixels wide, zero through 31, 12 pixels high. But the bottom row is not visible unless you scroll the play field so I only included 11 in this graphic, 0 through 10. If you create the play field using Batari Basic like so, you can see the grid and how the play field pixels are much bigger than the sprites pixels. And then the third area of activity, which I'm thinking of as the sprite position layer, which is independent of the sprites uh, resolution, which is 8 pixels across and 192 down, which is the screen, although technically it's it's eight pixels across and one pixel down every time you draw via the scan line. But the screen resolution is 160 by 192 um, in terms of your X and Y values that you can apply to the player zero sprite, player one sprite, the ball sprite, and the two missile sprites. So how you get your sprites to appear to be interacting with the play field? <laughs> well, the answer to that is math. And then once I have all that stuff calculated, I'm drawing the screen, which is simply the command draw screen. And then I'm using a go to to return back up to my game loop and start the whole thing all over again. All right, now let's talk about the actual game, Telemachus. Okay, so this is the design document. I realize I'm not probably, as I learn more about the coding, probably not gonna be able to accomplish all of this. In the center, is uh, where the game will start and the player character will be a ship and there will be a health station on screen and then there are four worlds surrounding this hub and each will have an objective i also want to figure out a more physics based movement system uh, instead of linear movement when you press the joystick where objects react to one another within a certain proximity. I'm kind of in this drawing defining my loop points. So for example, on the right hand side, I, I want so you can be able to loop up. When you go up, you'll appear on the bottom. And when you go down, you'll appear on the top. And when you go right, I'm not sure yet if I'm gonna have you loop all the way over to the left or if there'll be an invisible barrier or a physical barrier or whatnot. But You'll see there's a circle here, so that's like a planet. And if you go left, then you'll go back to the hub world. And so I've defined all those. <laughs> defined By defined, I mean I've, I've drawn an arrow on, the, on this sketch. In each of these four areas, there will be power-ups, and you'll simply run over them with your vessel, and it will turn your vessel a different color to indicate you have that current power-up. So it'll be a little bit nonlinear gameplay where you decide which planet you want to go to first. Okay, that's the first video, and in the next one, uh, we'll look at the movement of these two ships. Thanks for watching.